So I'm going to be talking about uh, explanation by truth making. Um, that's the topic for today. Uh, here's the like guiding idea behind the project that, that I'm pursuing here. Sentences are made true or made false by worldly states, by facts, by ways that the world is, could be maybe even impossible worldly states, things like that. Uh, now these relationships, uh, these two relationships in particular, the relationship of making true that can obtain between uh, some states and some sentences and the relationship of making false that can obtain between some states and some sentences, those are explanatory relations. Uh, they are the, so what's going on in uh, when one, an instance of one of these relations obtain is a worldly state is making true and in virtue of that explaining why a particular sentence is true. Uh, or a worldly state is making false and so explaining why a particular sentence is false. In other words, the like kind of guiding idea behind the uh, theory of explanation by making true or making false that I'm gonna propose here is that these things, these worldly states, both one, fix the truth values of sentences, and then two, explain why those sentences have those truth values. They're explanatory in that way. So here uh, is the, um, here's an outline. Here's what's gonna happen. Uh, to start, I'm going to introduce states. So I'm just gonna present a basic theory of the, a particularly important relation that states stand in, particularly important in the sense that it's gonna support the theory of making true and making false to come. Uh, after introducing that theory of states, it's a, it's a part of relation, I should also say. It's a relation where, where some states can be parts of others. After pre presenting that theory of states, I'm going to present truth conditions for a certain class of sentences, namely sentences that you can formulate using a language of first order logic. Uh, after doing that, I'm going to, um, so those first two parts is basically just presenting the theory that I'm interested in uh, presenting and developing in this talk. That, that'll be the theory. And then the rest of the talk will be kind of extracting some, what I think are nice consequences of that theory. So I'm gonna use the theory of states and the truth conditions to analyze a host of semantic notions. Um, I have a ridiculously long paper that corresponds to this talk. In the paper, I go through something like a dozen uh, semantic notions related to meanings of the sort uh, that you can analyze it using my preferred theory of states and, and truth-making. Uh, these are notions like uh, uh, the contents of sentences, what propositions are, entailment relations, parthood relations, containment relations, subject matters of sentences, the relation of aboutness, um, there's a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that this, that this theory can be used to analyze. In this talk, for, for, because of time constraints, of course, I'm only gonna talk about a few of those things. Uh, that'll be section three. Uh, and also section four. In section four, I will, I will talk about one thing in particular that I think is, uh, uh, one analysis in particular that I think is really interesting, an account of the truth conditions for counterfactuals. And I'm highlighting that in a kind of its own separate fourth section because the topic of the conference is explanation. And so the ideas in section four are kind of about explanation twice over. <laughs> One, because they're about how states determine the truth values of counterfactual expressions. Two, because counterfactual expressions are themselves explanatory or back explanations or track explanations or something like that. Um, Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the plan. Uh, so the theory of states. Here's the guiding idea. Um, it's, pr it's, pretty, it's pretty elementary. Some states are parts of other states and that parthood relation among states obeys some pretty simple rules. So the state of grass being green, for example, that, that's a state, that's a fact, grass is green. It's a state of the world in my sense of state. That state is part of the conjunctive state, grass is green and roses are red. That conjunctive state contains that, that like smaller state, grass is green uh, as, a, as a part. Um, now it turns out that this, relation, this parthood relation among states supports a really rich, interesting theory of how sentences can make true, or sorry, how states can make true or make false certain sentences. So what my theory of states is going to do is it's going to just present that, um, that theory, uh, present the foundations for that theory. 
Uh, so here's the basic framework for the theory that I'm gonna propose. We start with a set of states S and we start with a two place parthood relation over S, that little symbol, you can call it a square subset. Expressions of the form little s, square subset, little t, are a formal way of regimenting the claim that state s is part of state t. That's what that little, that's what that little symbol means, their expression means. So that's the basic framework that, we, that I'm gonna to use to propose my theory of states. Um, here's the theory itself. It consists of six conditions. For lack of time, I'm uh, just gonna go into the first three. Uh, which are also the simplest, um, but I'm going to briefly gesture at, uh, in, in detail, I mean, and then I'm going to briefly gesture at what the, uh, what the other three say. So here are some conditions on states. Here are some conditions that they satisfy. First of all, this part of relations on states is reflexive, meaning every state is part of itself. Uh, second of all, this part of relation on states is anti-symmetric, meaning uh, if uh, one state is part of another, and that other is part of the first, then those states are identical. Uh, finally, this part of the relation on, on states is transitive, meaning if a first state is part of a second, and a second state is part of a third, then that first state is part of that third state as well. Uh, so these three conditions together say that this part of the relation on states is a, is a partial order. Uh, so there, it's, a, it's a very you know, standard view of the parthood relation among all different sorts of items that uh, the parthood relation is a partial order over those items. And this, these three conditions just say the same thing for states. Okay, the other three conditions are more involved. Uh, the first says that the set of states is well-founded. Roughly what that means is um, you don't get the following situation. You never get a sequence of states such that each state properly contains as a part the next state in the sequence. That little square subset symbol without the uh, uh, horizontal line underneath it is a symbol for proper parthood. So being, being a part, but not being identical to. Um, so the well-foundedness condition on uh, S of the set of states along with the parthood relation just says there's no sequence of states, S1, S2, S3, S4, et cetera such that S1 contains S2 as a proper part, S2 contains S3 as a proper part, and so on. Um, you could think of this as the sort of state theoretic correlate of saying something like uh, reality is not gunky, uh, which is something that, that metaphysicians and, uh, have talked about and theories of parthood have, have explored. Okay, the last two conditions on states and parthood among states basically assert the existence of a, uh, uh, certain types of bounds on sets of states. Um, the first one says the following, the existence of least upper bounds says the following, take any set of states A, um, there is a state which is the least upper bound of that set of states A. Uh, I'm very happy to define that more precisely in the Q&A if you would like, I won't do that too precisely here. For present purposes, think of it like this. Uh, for any set of states A, there is a fusion of those states A. Um, meaning, and that, that, that basically means like there's a smallest state which contains all the states in A as parts. Um, and it's smallest in the sense that it is itself part of any other state which contains all the states as parts. Anyway, um, and the final condition on states is uh, kind of a correlate, but instead of least upper bound for, for the notion of a greatest lower bound, uh, this condition says that for any set of states A, there exists a state um, which is the greatest lower bound of those states. So this means something like, take any collection of states you want, there is a state which is both part of all of those states and which is itself bigger than any other state, which is part of all of those states. It's the greatest lower bound on those states. Okay, uh, that's the theory of statehood that I'm gonna be working with here. States can be parts of one another, uh, the parthood relation on states is a partial order. Uh, it's well-founded and uh, least upper bounds and greatest lower bounds always exist. Um, this basically adds up to saying that the states form a complete uh, well-founded lattice. Okay, so um, out of the weeds again, big picture guiding idea for this section. 
So now I'm gonna, what I'm now gonna do is present the truth conditions for some sentences to you. Uh, the truth conditions kind of piggybacking on the theory of states that I just presented in certain ways. Um, here's the guiding idea behind these truth conditions. To make a sentence true, what that is, what it is to make a sentence true, is just to have parts which make the parts of that sentence true. And to make a sentence false is just to have parts which make parts of that sentence false. Now, by parts of sentences, I, sentences, I don't mean anything super technical. I just mean, uh, you may be familiar with the recursive definition of a sentence from first order logic that tells you how you can uh, take simpler formulas and generate more complicated formulas from them. Uh, or alternatively, how a complicated formula is kind of built out of simpler formulas. Um, that's all I mean by talking about the parts of sentences. Uh, the guiding idea behind the truth condition I'm going to present to you is for a state to make a sentence true is for that state to have parts which make those ingredients, parts, the things that you put into the recursive definitions to get the more complicated sentences, um, true. And to make a sentence false is to have for a state to make a sense false is that parts which make those parts false. Um, so that's, that's the guiding idea. Uh, I'm gonna focus on sentences in first order logic, um, just because uh, you know time is finite again. Uh, although at the end, I'm gonna talk about counterfactuals. Um, okay, so the language is a first order language, uh, meaning uh, the language consists of a bunch of constants, a bunch of variables, for each natural number n, a bunch of n place predicates, uh, some logical constants, not and and or, some quantifiers uh, for all and there exist. And what I'm gonna do is give you a theory of the truth conditions for any sentence in the usual definition of a sentence that you can formulate using these bits of vocabulary. And the truth conditions will employ the, sort, the states, the facts that I mentioned uh, earlier. Okay, so, um, so for uh, again for time constraints, I can't, and because it just ex gets extremely technical, I'm not going to present the kind of fully rigorous truth conditions. I'm going to present to you first pass glosses on them. Uh, the first pass gloss on the condition for atomic, um, and I, I should say, if if you want me to, I'm happy to email you the handout. The handout has in it uh, a, m a much more fully rigorous formal uh, implementation of these truth conditions. Um, they involve things like variable assignments and stuff that I'm just gonna gloss over here. Uh, so here's, here are the truth conditions for atomic formulas uh, that I propose. Um, you, uh, you have a state S and you take an atomic formula. That state verifies, that's what a lot of people in this literature, uh, the word they use in place of makes true. That, play, that state verifies that atomic formula if and only if that state is in a certain set of states. So in the models for these, um, basically what I'm doing to you, for you is uh, uh, recursively defining a bunch of a, a space of models. Um, and uh, in that the definitions of these models, there is a formal widget that uh, maps every atomic formula to a set of states. So these models have a set of states S, they have a two place parthood relation over S that satisfies the six conditions I mentioned earlier. They also have functions which take every atomic formula to sets of states. They have, they have two of these functions. What these functions do is intuitively they take an atomic formula to the set of states which make that formula true in the model in question. One of them does that. The other function takes an atomic formula to the set of states which make that formula false in the model in question. And uh, the, on the slide, you can see these expressions, uh, capital B sub and then a atomic formula, capital F sub and atomic formula. Those are just, uh, those just denote the sets that these functions map these atomic formulas to. So B sub formula is the set of all states which make the formula true. F sub formula is the set of all states which make the formula false. Uh, and atomic, the basic sort of starting truth condition for this first order language just says to verify a state is to be in the set of verifiers of the state. 
And to falsify a state is to be in the set of falsifiers of a state. Okay, negation. Uh, here's the truth condition for negation. A state S verifies a sentence not phi if and only if that state S falsifies the sentence phi. And a state S falsifies the sentence not phi if and only if that state S verifies the sentence phi. So verification and falsification are in this sense kind of symmetric with one another when it comes to negation. To verify a negated formula is to falsify the corresponding unnegated formula. To falsify a negated formula is to verify the corresponding unnegated formula. Um, so as I'll talk about briefly later, so far the truth conditions I've posited are uh, the same as certain sorts of truth conditions that other people in the literature have posited. Um, here though, the truth conditions I posit for this type of theory of how states can make certain sentences true or false uh, diverge from those, those other conditions. So this is the truth condition for conjunction. And here's what it says. Take a state S and take two sentences phi and psi. Then S verifies the conjunction phi and psi, if and only if, there are states T and U, which are parts of S, such that T verifies phi and U verifies psi. In other words, what this condition says is, for a state to verify a conjunction, just is for that state to have parts which verify the conjuncts. So this is a very nice um, fleshing out of the guiding idea from earlier. To make a sentence true is to have parts which make the parts of that sentence true. S verifies phi and psi if and only if S has parts which make phi true and a part, a part which makes phi true and a part which makes psi true. Falsification is uh, similar. So the state S falsifies the conjunction phi and psi if and only if for some state T in S, uh, sorry, t for some state T in capital S, such that T is part of our state little s either t falsifies phi or t falsifies psi. In other words, for a state to falsify a conjunction is for the state to contain a part which falsifies at least one of the conjuncts. Disjunction is um, very similar, although flipped. So uh, the truth conditions for disjunction go like this. You take a state S, sentence is phi and psi. S verifies the disjunction phi or psi, just in case S has a state T as a part, which verifies either phi or psi. So to verify disjunction is to have a part which verifies one of the disjuncts. Um, S falsifies phi or psi, if and only if there are states um, that are parts of S, T and U, such as T and U are parts of S, T falsifies phi and U falsifies psi. In other words, to falsify a disjunction is to have parts which falsify uh, both of the disjuncts. Okay, I'm not going to present the full de definitions or even the kind of approximately full definitions, uh, truth conditions for universals and existentials because they get they get pretty convoluted. Um, here's the verification condition for a universal formula, though. Uh, the falsification condition and then the verification and falsification conditions for existentials are uh, basically what you can expect. Uh, what you would expect given this condition for universals, but I'm happy to present them explicitly in the q and if that if that would be helpful. So take a take a state s and consider the formula for all x by x, where in the sub formula phi x, uh, x is the only variable that appears free. Then the state s verifies for all x phi x, if and only if for each object o, um, so another widget in the formal widget in these models that I didn't tell you about is they come with objects and uh, those objects serves as the candidate denotations of the constants and the variables um, in the language in question. And so what is it for a state to verify universal? Well, it's for take it, 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 it's for the following to happen. Take any object in that set of objects in the model. Then there's a state T which is both one, a part of S, and two, uh, when you interpret the free variable X in phi X as denoting O, 
T verifies the resulting formula by X. In other words, to verify a universal is to have parts with the following property, or let's be a little more precise. To verify a universal is to have the following property. For any object, which the uh, uh, variable in the universal could be taken to denote, um, there is a state which is part of that uh, original state, which verifies the formula that you get when you take that variable to denote that object. Okay, so that was a lot. Um, here's the theory of state space that I wanted to get on the table and then talk about in the remainder of my time. Uh, it, I call it state space. So state space is these truth conditions. It's actually 12 truth conditions, six verification conditions, and six falsification conditions for and or not atomics and uh, universals and existentials along with the logical conditions from earlier, the conditions that say parthood among states is a partial order that's well-founded and that where fusions and fissions that call the greatest lower bounds always exist. Um, so that's the theory of state space. It's a theory of how these worldly states, these facts, make certain sentences true uh, and make certain sentences false in, in this kind of explanatory way that I described earlier. <clears throat> Okay, so um, let me just take a moment to briefly explain three differences between this approach to first order semantics and uh, the state space approach, as I'm calling it, and other approaches. Um, there, are, there are actually a bunch of differences. And in some ways, the main difference is the theorem that I'm about to present to you that sort of backs all the forthcoming cool analyses of semantic notions. Um, but at this juncture, at least, I thought it was worth pointing out a few differences, because those of you who are familiar with this literature might be wondering what's so different about what I propose. So first difference, uh, the truth conditions in state space uh, for quantifiers use variable assignments and not constants. Again, for lack of uh, time, I can't present to you that in full detail. Uh, but the conditions in the literature, and these are conditions that people like um, von Frossen and Fine, uh, uh, Kratzer's situation semantics, Perry and Barwise, um, um, the sorts of, uh, a for a lot of those theories, not all of them, uh, Sam Elgin too, I should mention, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them give truth conditions for quantifiers that are based on uh, substitutions of constants for the free variables uh, in the expressions you get when you like delete the quantifier. Um, and truth conditions like that are, it's well known that they're kind of um, vulnerable to a number of problems related to uh, impoverished languages. In particular, if you have a language L uh, such that there aren't enough constants to denote all the objects, it could come out in your semantics that a state makes a sentence, uh, a universal sentence true, merely because the, the objects that would, as it were, falsify the universal aren't named by any of the constants in your language. And so uh, uh, you get the kind of intuitively false result that the universal is true, even though in the model, it really, it really shouldn't be, uh, it, it shouldn't come out true. A bunch of well-known reasons like that for preferring uh, variable assignments over certain kinds of constant substitutions when giving truth conditions. State space is better than these other state-based approaches to first order semantics in the literature because it uses variable assignments. <coughs> Second comparison. State space does a better job of respecting certain structural similarities, strictly speaking, certain dualisms among the logical vocabulary of first order languages. So the theories of state uh, semantics proposed by Fine, Elgin, von Frossen, uh, and many others um, are not nearly as kind of dualistic in their treatments of, for example, conjunction is disjunction as the theory I just presented to you is. So um, uh, to give a really quick example, those other theories say uh, to make a conjunction true, they don't quite say what my theory says, but they say something kind of like what my theory said. They say to make a conjunction true is to have parts which have an additional property that I won't mention, which make each of the conjuncts true. But then they go on to say, as for disjunctions, to make a disjunction true is just to make one of the disjuncts true. In other words, 
it's not to have a part which makes one of the disjuncts true, it's to yourself make the disjunct true, which is a kind of asymmetric treatment of disjunction. Like the more symmetric thing to the conjunction treatment, when they say that to make a conjunction true is to have parts with a certain property that makes the conjunct true, would be to say to make a disjunction true is to have parts maybe with this property uh, that make the disjuncts true. In other words, something much closer to state space. In fact, the uh, uh, majority of approaches that I've seen in the literature don't endorse symmetric sort of truth conditions like that for verifications of, of uh, uh, conjunctions and disjunctions. The reasons they don't, uh, there, are, there are reasons for that. And it's uh, it, given the kind of frameworks in question, the theories in question, it's very understandable why those authors wouldn't have proposed those conditions, won't get into that uh, discussion for lack of time. Um, all I want to point out here is I think it's a really nice feature of state space that it respects certain kind of sub dualities between conjunction and disjunction, or for that matter, between universals and existentials, dualities that these other theories uh, don't, don't uh, respect. Finally, and this is related, I think state space does a better job of adhering to that intuitive guiding the intuitive guiding explanatory motivations for state-based approaches to truth conditions that I mentioned earlier. Because again, those other theories don't say things like to make a disjunction true is to have parts which make the parts of the disjunction true. They say to make a disjunction true is to you yourself make the parts true. Um, and uh, so for this, this is just a third way in which I think state space does better. It kind of captures the guiding idea of states making sentences true and false uh, better. Okay, that was overly brief, and uh, but just uh, it's worth moving on, I think, at this point to see uh, the sorts of things that state space can be used to do. Okay, so before I show you those things, I have to present to you, in many ways, the key theorem that you can prove using these truth conditions in that in that Mariology from earlier. First, a definition, uh, a cone is a set of states with a very nice property. It's a set of states such that uh, that set contains all and only the states that contain some one state as a part. Uh, think of cones kind of like this, like uh, every cone is characterized by a single state called its point. Take all the states in capital S, the set of states, which contain that point as a part, that's a cone. Um, now here's the really nice theorem. Uh, it turns out you can prove that for each sentence uh, in L, every sentence, every first order sentence whatsoever, the verifiers of that sentence uh, can be written as a union of cones, which are maximal in that set. I'll, I'll kind of briefly explain that, what that means in a second. And the falsifiers of that sentence can be written as a union of cones, which are maximal in that set. In other words, Verification and falsification is completely characterized by number one, cones, and number two, cones that have this nice property of being maximal. So let me, let me just show you a picture since that's, that's probably the best way to explain what that theorem says. Here is a, a disjunction, P, P, A, or Q, B. Here are two pictures of the truth make, the things that determine this disjunction's truth values. On the left, we've got We've got all the states which verify it. On the right, we've got all the states which falsify it. Uh, notice that the verifiers um, are, can be written as kind of two cones unioned together. So uh, one cone has as its point the smallest state which verifies the atomic sentence PA. And that whole cone, sort of the leftmost cone, the thing that's like uh, all the way to the left and mostly a solid line and has a little bit of a dashed line uh, to the, going to the right. That cone uh, represents all and only the states which verify the sentence PA. The middle-ish cone uh, that has that point V sub QB represents all and only the states that verify the sentence QB. Um, together, the union of those two cones is uh, the set of all and only the states that verify the disjunction. Um, this is an example of what the theorem says, um, that the verifiers of the sentence are a union of cones, and in particular a union of maximal cones in the, set, in the following sense. 
there is no way to take, like take the cone whose point is VPA. There's no way to make that cone bigger and still remain in the set of verify. In other words, any enlargening of that cone is gonna include a state which no longer verifies the disjunction. Um, same thing for the cone whose point is VQB. Any enlarging of that cone will include a state that no longer verifies the disjunction. So those cones are maximal among the verifiers of the disjunction in that sense. Neither of those cones can be made any bigger. And what the theorem says is the verifiers for any sentence whatsoever uh, have that structure. They are unions of these cones which are maximal among their own sets of verifiers. Same with the falsifiers. Here's just a picture of what the falsifiers will, not always, but generically look like for this cone. Um, um, I won't explain why, just to keep moving, but, um, but that's basically what they'll look like. They'll look like a single cone uh, for a disjunction. <clears throat> okay, so that's a lot of stuff. Uh, let me just start listing off some of the things that you can do with that stuff. Let me just start listing off some of the really nice, neat analyses that this uh, state space theory and that, that theorem that I just show you support. So first, um, that theory uh, and theorem support the following analysis of the content of a sentence. The content of a sentence is just the pair of sets which verify and falsify it. So the content of phi is the pair V phi comma F phi, where V phi is a set of verifiers, F phi is a set of falsifiers. This suggests the following more general uh, uh, the following analysis of the more general notion of a proposition. So a proposition then, it's natural to say, uh, is a pair PV, PF, such that the elements in that pair are sets of states. PV is a union of cones, which are maximal in PV. And PF is a union of cones, which are maximal in PF. In other words, a proposition is just one of these pairs, each of whose elements is a uh, union of maximal cones in themselves. <clears throat> of course, these two analyses together imply that sentences express propositions. That's a really nice feature of them. There are other really nice features too. Um, here's, uh, uh, it turns out you can use, one of the really nice features is you can use these notions to give an account of partial content, how, what it takes for one sentence's content to be part of another. The uh, account gets pretty complicated. Um, uh, because in fact, there are a lot of different similar notions of partial content in the vicinity. And when you're trying to like, uh, you know, judge the fruits of the account of truth conditions and state-based semantics that I've given you, you've got to be careful which partial, partial content notion is the kind of right one to judge a, a result by intuitively. I've just presented one here for you. Um, it's, uh, what it is for the positive content of one proposition to be part of the positive content of another proposition. Basically, the analysis says this. Um, in, the, in the very simple case, here's what it says. Suppose that the positive contents of these propositions are just single cones. So they're not unions of multiple cones, it's just a, union, it's just a single cone uh, for each proposition. Then Q's positive content is part of Q's just in case the cones have the structure such that the point of the cone which defines the verifiers for P is part of the point of the cone which defines the verifiers for Q. And, and this is now redundant in this very simple case, the point of the cone which defines uh, the verifiers for Q contains as a part the point of the cone which defines the verifiers for P. In the more general case, what, what I require for one proposition partial content to be part of another propositions is that there's all, those always happen, those correspondences. Every, every point of a cone for one proposition is part of a point of a cone for the other, and every point of a cone for the other is part of a point of a cone for, uh, or sorry, contains a point of the cone of a cone for the first proposition as well, where all those cones are maximum. Um, but anyway, this is just a, a, just a very quickly uh, sketch another really nice feature of this analysis. It gives you an account of partial content, which is notoriously uh, hard to do. It also gives you an account of subject matter. Here's what the subject matter of a sentence is. Take, take the verifiers 
of that sentence, so the, the union of cones, which are maximal, fuse all the points of all those cones. Then do the same thing for the falsifiers. Take the union of cones, which are maximal, that uh, define the falsifiers, fuse all those points. Uh, the fusion means least upper bound in this context. Uh, then the subject matter of the sentence in question is just that pair of states, the state that is the fusion of all the sort of smallest verifiers of the sentence, and the state that is the fusion of all the sort of smallest falsifiers of the sentence. Uh, last thing you can analyze, a relation of entailment. Um, basically, the relation says this, one proposition entails another just in case Every way of making the first true, every state which makes the first true contains the state which makes the second true as a part. And every state which makes the second false contains the state which makes the first false as a part. <clears throat> so this is a, the two conditions capture the kind of modus ponens and modus tollens uh, characteristics of entailment. Okay, so that's just a few analyses that this theory of states and uh, truth making can be used to, to give, a few analyses of a few semantic notions. To wrap up, let's see how I'm doing, okay. Uh, I just wanna talk briefly about how you can use this theory to give uh, an account of the truth conditions of quantifiers. Once again, to keep things, uh, to try to simplify things, I've only given the verification condition for a quantifier. The verification condition goes like this, and it's actually kind of related to something we just talked about in the last talk. Um, state S verifies the counterfactual, if phi were the case, then psi would be the case. If and only if for each state T that has the following properties, one, T verifies that antecedent phi, two, S is more similar to T than to any state which does not verify phi. For us, uh, S verifies if phi were the case and psi would be the case, if and only if for each such state T, there exists a state U, which is part of T, which verifies psi, the consequent of the counterfactual. Um, this analysis of the truth conditions of counterfactuals is extremely similar to the analysis of the truth conditions of counterfactuals given by Lewis and Stallnacher. Of course, their account uses possible worlds, um, fans of state-based approaches to truth conditions, have a lot of reasons for disliking uh, possible world accounts of the truth conditions of counterfactuals. I mean, just one that kind of came up in the previous talk is states are often taken to be the sorts of things that can be impossible. Um, you, can, you can very easily derive the existence of impossible states in the framework that I gave you from before. Um, it's, it's kind of no big ontological deal. Uh, and then you can use those states to give truth conditions for counterfactuals with impossible antecedents without, without having to get too worried about uh, uh, the sorts of things that some people might have been worried about when they were doing the same with possible worlds. Um, so that's one of the benefits to this kind of Lewis-like, Stallnacher-like approach to counterfactuals using states. Another is that this approach to counterfactuals conjoined with the analysis of entailment that I gave you before implies the falsity of this principle, the simplification principle. Um, the simplification principle says, if you have a counterfactual of the form, if phi or, or chi were the case, then psi would be the case, then that, the truth of that counterfactual entails the truth of, if phi were the case, then psi would be the case. In other words, you can always drop a disjunction. Uh, some people think this principle uh, should be maintained. So, one of the other, uh, one of the main state approaches to states and truth making in the literature from Kit Fine uh, uh, endorses this, this principle. I think it shouldn't for the sorts of reasons that um, <clears throat> uh, Van Inbagen, uh, Lower, and others brought up in uh, response to some critical reviews of Lewis's counterfactual book. Uh, there, are, there are cases where this simplification principle seems false. In addition, uh, the simplification principle plus another plausible principle implies antecedent strengthening. So impl it implies that if you have a counterfactual, then that imply then that counterfactual entails uh, any counterfactual where where the that's the same except an additional conjunct has been added to the antecedent. And for sorts of release it reasons relating to uh, stuff that Lewis talks about in his book counterfactuals, that's a that's a really bad principle to 
to uh, validate. Okay, um, so uh, just to wrap up, uh, state space is a theory of how states of the world make some sentences true and other sentences false in a kind of explanatory notion of make. Uh, it's a reasonably complete theory in that it is a complete theory for first order logic and uh, extends to cover um, counterfactual connectives as well. It's explanatory, both because it count covers counterfactuals, which are often taken to be explanatory, and because um, the relations of verification and falsification are, as I, as I understand them, explanatory relations. Um, and it, it just has, it bears a whole lot of fruit. Like there's a lot of stuff you can analyze uh, in, in a very like successful, intuitive, satisfying way using this particular approach to, to states and truth. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.